Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Anger is a powerful force in politics, and there is a lot of it about. Donald Trump, Brexit, and a host of populist movements have been fueled by anger with the way things are. Where does it come from? How best to respond? Well, one much discussed provocative perspective comes not from a politician, but the Canadian clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson whose defence of traditional values has won him a worldwide following. Is his diagnosis liberating or dangerous? Jordan Peterson, welcome to Hard Talk. Thanks for the invitation. At the beginning of this year, you wrote this book, 12 Rules for Life, an Antidote to Chaos. And in the six or seven months since, around the world, it's sold pretty much two million copies. Yeah, it's pretty coming extraordinary. up on that. Yes. You have struck some sort of a chord. Why do you think that is? Because I'm having a serious conversation with my viewers and listeners and readers about how to structure their lives individually and the relationship between responsibility and meaning and it's a level of discourse I would say or a level of analysis that people don't often have an opportunity to participate in or to hear it's filling a need in our culture apparently a search for meaning is it also appealing reaching out to people and in particular men it seems from all the surveys men who are angry and who feel no, lost I... and alienated well I don't think it's reaching out to them because they're angry. I think that it's reaching out to people who are alienated, uh, certainly. There's lots of people who are alienated. I think that it's uh, partly focused to some degree on young men because my YouTube channel is very popular and most of the people who watch YouTube happen to be young men. So uh, that's skewed the listening audience in, in, in terms of that demographic. It isn't obvious that it's only young men that are buying the book. That's much more mixed. The, so. Yeah, there are many books out there, and over the years many published, which talk about a meaningful life and how to live it, and you call yours rules for life. I mean, it, you could perhaps characterize it as a form of self-help, but there are very few of those sorts of books that go into great detail about the dangers of Marxism, talk about the history of Mao's China, Stalin's Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. There's a real political content to your book, and I wonder why you are so preoccupied with reminding your individuals, who you say are searching for meaning, reminding them so repeatedly, so often, about the dangers of totalitarian communism. Well, I'm not. I mean, there's only a section in one of the chapters that actually deals with that, although there are motifs that run through it, but it's more a matter of being concerned about collectivist ideologies in general and the danger of ideological thought as a means of guiding yourself through life. So, I mean, one of the failures that characterized the communist totalitarian states and equally on the fascist side was the failure of individual character because, for example, in the Soviet Union, equally in places like Maoist China, People were called upon to falsify their own experience, to lie in the service of the state, to not say things they needed to say and to not stand up when they should have stood up. I'm just wondering whether it's your analysis that if you look around the world today, but particularly the Western world, which mm -hmm. you focus most of your attention upon, you see a real danger of uh, some sort of renewal of, of a neo-Marxist tendency well, in you society. Certainly see, you certainly see that in the universities. The universities in, in North America and to some degree in Europe as well are, especially in the social sciences and the humanities, are completely dominated by a left-leaning political agenda. The stats on that are crystal clear. Most of that's been generated by Jonathan Haidt and the Heterodox Academy. There are very few centrists or right-leaning people in the academy and that means that the discourse on campuses has become increasingly radicalized and the problem I have with that isn't the fact that it's left-wing it's the fact that it's extreme, and if the same thing was happening on the right wing, I would be equally perturbed about that. But it's not. And the problem is, is that we, we as a society don't know how to parameterize the excesses of the left. That's our problem, right? We know perfectly well that the left can go too far. That happened many times over the course of the 20th century, but we don't know when. 
And so we don't know what the danger signs are, the markers. But with your focus on what you see as the, the real dangers of the left and its totalitarian That's inclinations... That's not my focus. My fundamental focus is on the necessity for people to adopt individual but, but responsibility. It, right, but if I just may continue my thought, uh, what it seems to me uh, beyond doubt, just reading your own writings but also reactions to your own writings, is that you have found a way of appealing to and winning the sympathies of uh, a, a great number of people who, to be sort of crude about it, are supporters of Donald Trump, who are by nature, it seems, interested in the populist movements that we see in many different parts of the world right now, and some of whom identify with this phrase, the alt-right. Yeah, and I, I wonder how don't... you, as a, as a psychologist and an academic, feel about the, the nature of so many of the people who sympathize with you. I don't think it's true. I think that that's a vision of my followers, and I don't think of them as followers. I think of them as viewers and readers and listeners. I know perfectly well. I've talked to 150,000 people in the last three months at 55 live events. I understand my audience, and I know perfectly well that the vast majority of them are there because they were rather disoriented in life for, for various reasons and have decided to develop a personal vision and to take more responsibility and to try to tell the truth as best they can, and that that's actually helping them a lot. That's what's happening. The thing is, is that... But, but would you recognize there's an overlap between the sorts of people who, who can deeply sympathize and find a, a resonance in your message, and many of those who have turned to Donald Trump in the United States right now? I mean, well, there's some overlap because there's, there's like 30 million people watching my videos, so there's overlap across the entire political spectrum. But the thing is, is that in the discussions that I've had with people, let's say in the mainstream media, about the response to me, there's a chronic and constant attempt to make it political. It's not political. What I'm doing is not political. It's psychological. And so, like, I talk to but, at yeah, least... Of course, but you can't control the way in which your words and your messages are perceived and used by but others. But I also know perfectly and I, well... I, I'd be kind of interested to know whether you're worried about it. Well, of course I'm worried about it, but I also know that I've received hundreds of letters from people who've indicated quite clearly that they were attracted by the blandishments of the alt-right, let's say, and that they've been led back to the political centre as a consequence of listening to what I've been telling them. Would it be fair to say that, that one of the core messages of your book is that we underestimate the power and the relevance and the importance of... Uh, old stories and myths, including the Christian Bible, but also including a host of other stories, which you say have survived the test of time and tell us truths about ourselves, which many people today, and you, I think, would then say many people in academia today who are into uh, sort of constructivism and relativism, are missing the truth of old verities. Would, would you agree yes, with that? Yes, I would that? say that's definitely a theme that runs through the book, is that there's wisdom in traditional stories that we need to understand, not merely believe, but also to understand. And so, for example, last year I did a series of 15 lectures on Genesis, right? And most of that audience was young men, and that's been viewed by millions of people online now. And, and the, Bi the Bible in particular? I mean, you say the Bible, for better or worse, is the foundational document of Western civilization. It is careful, its careful, res respectful study can reveal things to us about ourselves. Uh, and what we believe and how we should act uh, more than can be discovered in almost any other matter. It, it, yes, The Bible's right. central, it seems, to your well, belief it's certainly system. central. It, no, it's central to the... It's central to Western culture. It's the foundational document of Western culture. I mean, and, you, it's not... and, and, and this word truth, which is quite an important word for you, you think the Bible contains irrefutable truth? Well, I don't know what irrefutable means necessarily, but it certainly contains a form of truth. I mean, it, it's a narrative form of truth. It's the same form of truth that you see presented in front of you when you go see movies, for example, or when you read great literature. Well, movie, a truth but movies are fiction. I mean, yeah, but, but look, we wouldn't be able to rank order fiction in terms of its quality if it didn't bear some relationship to truth. But I suppose, what I'm, as you know, this, this show is aired right around the world, has yeah. millions of viewers uh, who, of course, are not from a Christian tradition at all, not yeah. from any Western tradition. They may be Hindus, they may be Muslims, they may be animists. Mm -hmm. but, but how can they, therefore, relate to your 12 rules for life when they are so wedded to the culture and the traditions and the truths, as you would put it, of the Bible? Well, I also draw on other traditions and extensively throughout the book and also in my first book, but the attitude that I'm taking towards the stories that, that 
our culture is predicated on is one that people from all over the world find engaging. So it's, it's because these stories are deep enough and significant enough so that there's plenty of room at the table for everyone to have an intelligent discussion about them. And I'm not necessarily saying that, um, that I'm not saying at all that there, are, there, aren't, there isn't wisdom to be derived from other traditions, but I do see destabilization in our own culture about our fundamental values. And because our values, at least in part, were derived from Judeo-Christian writings, then it's useful, as far as I'm concerned, to return to them to discover what they mean. All right, so we, we, we've heard from you, you, you your fear of totalitarianism as you see it uh, evidenced in the 20th century. We also know that you regard the Bible as a, as a foundation stone of, of your thinking. Here's what a fellow Canadian philosopher, Paul Thagard, has said about what he sees as, as the weakness in your argument. He says, Peterson assumes that the only alternative to religious morality is some form of totalitarianism or despondent nihilism. But secular ethics, secular ethics have flourished since the 18th century and even before. He talks about David Hume, Immanuel Kant, Jeremy Bentham. You don't seem to give any real importance to these sorts of secular no, I ethics. I don't think that's true at all. I think that I have great respect for Enlightenment doctrines, and it's clearly the case that our current rather fortunate situation economically and politically is the consequence of something like a marriage between these old stories and the fundamental traditions that are in them and the Enlightenment doctrines upon which countries like England, for example, are founded. So, and I'm a, I'm a scientist with many published works, and so I'm perfectly aware of, despite the criticisms of that particular philosopher, perfectly aware of the utility of a scientific and enlightened approach. But to think that that humanistic values, let's say secular values, have flourished for a long time, and then to call that 200 years only means that that philosopher and I have very different ideas about what a long time is. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm I, an evolutionary biologist, I, by the way, not a political philosopher, and well, so let, 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 my let, time scale is thousands of years, not hundreds of years. Yeah, your time scale is thousands of years, but I wonder what, how you then conceptualize the importance of change. You know, a, a lot of your work is about constancy and finding mm -hmm. truths in the, in the very deep past. But mm -hmm. what about the importance of change? I mean, if right. one thinks about everything from uh, the emancipation of women, equality for women, think about gay rights, think about civil rights. Mm -hmm. These are changes that we've seen in our societies in the last 50 years. And many people think that your philosophy actually has no real place for change at all. Well, it, it runs counter that, to change. All that means is that they haven't act actually haven't read it. Because one of the things that I point out very clearly in the book is that you have a, an internal guide to meaning. It's, a, it's an instinct. It's a manifestation of something called the orienting reflex, which is a very deep instinct. And what it does is try to place you on the border between stasis and transformation, which is where you need to be. Because in order to survive properly, you have to, you have to maintain your structure, but you have to update it in the face of constant challenge. For people watching this, let's ask a, a, a basic question. If I were living in the late 19th century in the UK as a man, I may well have persuaded myself that the natural order of things is for men to have the vote and women not to. If you were living at that time with your regard for tradition and long-term eternal truths, you might well side with those who oppose the emancipation of women. Well, assuming that my primary emphasis is on the maintenance of tradition, but like I said, it's not. My primary emphasis is on the ability for people to live in a, in a context that's defined by, by active meaning. And so, for example, to the degree that we're engaging in a discussion here that, that is actually going to be meaningful to both of us and to the people who are watching it, what, will, what that will actually signify is that we've done a proper job of staying within a tradition that's sufficiently general so that we can all understand it and sufficiently updating it at the same time. But to stick with the equality for women then and to stick with specifics, why do you argue that society today has been overly and dangerously feminized? Well, because I see a backlash against masculinity. And a, and a sense that there's something, that there's something toxic about but what, masculinity. But what is this idea of being such. over? What, why is society overly feminized? Well, I didn't ever say that society was overly feminized. So if we're going to discuss my views, we should use my actual words. I believe that there's a danger in our society at the moment of making the assumption that our culture, for example, is a tyrannical patriarchy, which it is in some small part, and that any active um, engagement on the part of young men in particular is indistinguishable from an unacceptable power 
and dominance drive, which I don't believe. But surely, I think if, all if, of that if, is if, inappropriate if, and incorrect. If much of the power and authority over a very long historical period is lain with men, mm -hmm. isn't it only inevitable that some men will get a little hacked off when women are given a, a, a stab at something approaching equality? Well, that could be inevitable, but that doesn't make it right, and it's certainly not something that I support. So, my, my so you think men's resentment is more I'm important than women's effort to attain equality? I'm not in favour of resentment at all. I think that if you're resentful, something's, something's definitely wrong. Either you need to grow the hell up and, and, and take stock of your life, or you have some things to say to people that you haven't been saying. You say science undoubtedly shows us that men and women have different traits, and there's a lot of science to, to back you up on mm -hmm. that, but you say that because of that, men are hardwired to achieve success and to be successful in a way that women are not? No, not at all. I've never said anything like that. I've said that there are biological differences between men and women that express themselves in temperament and, and in occupational choice, and that any attempt to enforce equality of outcome is unwarranted and ill-advised as a consequence. And yet some of the most successful societies, judged on contentment indices mm -hmm. or indeed material success, are those, for example, in Scandinavia. Where the, where where, the temperamental differences between men and women are larger but than they are in any other society. Well, so you say, you point out that in Scandinavia many more women choose to be health workers than engineers, for example. It's not what but, I say, it's what the large-scale scientific no, investigation fair, has revealed. Fair enough. But equally, Scandinavia is full of societies, one could point to Norway, Way, where they've made a specific legislative effort, for example, with a quota of 40% of women on corporate boards or a quota for women to be in Parliament. Right. They've, they've specifically engaged in social engineering and it seems to be working and it seems it to doesn't be... doesn't seem to be it's, working well, particularly. Well, forgive me, but Norway is top of every contentment index that we see across the world. Well, OK, so first of all, Norway has plenty of oil money, which is definitely contributing to that. And second, it depends on what you mean by working. There's no evidence, for example, that the legislation that was designed to increase the number of women on boards has produced any movement whatsoever in the number of pe women who hold managerial and administrative positions in Norway. The theory was that as societies became more egalitarian, that men and women would become more the same. But that isn't what's happened. What's happened is the biggest differences between men and women now, temperamentally and in terms of their own interest, have manifested themselves in the Scandinavian countries. And so what that will mean is that men and women will make different choices in occupation if you let them have free choice. Now, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to stop that from happening? Is that the feminist perspective? Let's get back to a word I used before and ask you directly. Do you approve of... Do you think it's a dangerous word, equality? This word, equality, what do you approve of equality of opportunity, but I think that equality of outcome considerations are detestable and dangerous beyond belief. So for so, you, whether it be uh, gay rights campaigners, civil rights campaigners, uh, or indeed women's rights campaigners, if they want to see equality deliverable in outcomes, they are damaging society, are they? Well, it depends on how far they go with it. I mean, and how they measure it. I mean, these are very difficult technical issues. But if your a priori axiomatic assumption is that if there are differences in outcome, those are a consequence of patriarchal oppression, then it's a non-starter as far as I'm concerned, because there are multiple reasons for an unequal outcome. Do you think it was helpful for you to base a lot of your science about the difference between genders on lobsters? Well, I haven't based any of my science about well, the uh, difference between men and women on lobsters. You talk about how lobsters and humans behave the same, and in that context you said the girls, only thing that I've girls said. aren't attracted to boys who are their friends, they're attracted to boys who win status contests contest with other boys, and you describe that in the yeah. same breath as you describe how male and female lobsters well, behave. It isn't, it isn't me that makes those cases. That's a, that's a truism of evolutionary biology. If you, one of the is it a truism of, of evolutionary biology that what we learn from lobsters can be applied to humans? Well, some of it is because the neurochemical structures are very, very similar. So, and it's also the case that well, like one of the things... Bro, I mean, I, I'm no expert and I know that... Yeah, but I am. Yeah, and I know that you can mm -hmm. command a lot of science that I cannot, but mm -hmm. it just seems to me, on the face of it, to be somewhat bizarre to compare lobsters and humans given the different size of their brains. It is bizarre, that's exactly why I did it, because I was trying to make the case that one of the chronic leftist criticisms of Western society is its hierarchical nature, and that's often put at the feet of, let's say, Western society, patriarchy, and the capitalist system. It's part of the Marxist critique. But hierarchies have been around for 350 million years, and so you can't place them at the feet of the Western political system. And they've been around for so long 
that our neurochemical systems have evolved to to their evolved to match their existence. I mean, is it, is it is it study of lobsters that's also one of the foundations for your belief that you know a mother and a father are crucially important to the raising of a child? It's uh, certainly the case that they're crucially important if you compare them to single parents, because all of the developmental literature indicates that the outcomes for children who have two parents are much better than the outcomes for child, and, and children And physical who have one. punishment for children, uh, uh, efficacious as far as you're concerned? Minimal necessary force is the proper principle for discipline in any, for, in any sort of relationship and you have to negotiate that with your child and with anyone else that you interact with. You see, and that's definitely the theme that motivates chapter 5 which is called don't let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. So obviously discipline for children is necessary and negotiating how that's going to be done is very difficult. It, it is interesting. I mean, you are an advocate, in essence, for toughening up for, uh, I mean, you say things like, you know, men have to, I don't know if you ever use the phrase, but others do man up in a way that they consistently Actually, fail to do. I usually mention that they should stop being pathetic weasels. Pathetic so, weasels, yeah, yeah, right. So I guess that would fall into the toughen so, up so, category. So, so I suppose one odd thing about you and the way that the public debate around you has worked out is that you seem so brittle and thin-skinned about criticism. Uh, well, I, I, I suppose you might make that case, but I don't think that my media experiences have demonstrated that. I would say quite the contrary. Well, your media experiences, your social media experiences do suggest that. The, one of the, the, the best-known critiques of your work from Pankaj Mishra in the New York Review of Books oh, yes, had you one. so angry, I mean, and half the language because that you use, I, was... I, can't, I can't repeat, but you called him an arrogant, racist, son of a you-know-what. Mm -hmm. you, you, you said that you would happily slap him if he was in the same That's room right. as you. That's because he referred to a friendship I had with a native Canadian guy of, of several decades and said that I was romancing the noble savage, which I regarded as an indefensible statement. And if he had been on, on the right, you can be sure he would have been but, torn but, to I mean, shreds by humility? the Twitter What about mob? some of the values you tell all the rest of us that we, we must try to pursue? I mean, humility is one of them. You say you must assume the person you're listening to may know something you don't. Yes, you should try to do that on the off chance that they can tell you something that oh, you don't know. But you just see it an off chance, because... Well, you're I mean, pretty convinced, I, that was you're a, pretty convinced it was an you're ironic. Right. It was yeah. an ironic comment. I'm more convinced that I would rather know some things that I don't know. And I do listen to people very, very carefully, just like I'm listening to you very, very carefully. And I do do that because I would rather know some things that I don't know than be completely sure that what I already know is correct. That Fine. doesn't mean I won't defend my points, but I'm very good at talking to people and listening to them. I've been doing it for thousands and thousands of hours, and I've learned plenty from people that I've disagreed with. Because your success is very striking. I just wonder, and you talk a lot about success and what, what leads to success. Has your success made your life more meaningful? Uh, I would say yes, but it's... In it's, what ways? Well, it's more intense. The stakes are higher. The, the impact is larger. The amount of responsibility I bear for what I say is... Is, has increased and the number of people that I'm affecting has grown immensely and so all of that's associated with a deeper sense of meaning but it's not without its cost I have to be very careful for all sorts of reasons and so I'm trying to be very careful and bearing in mind that what I'm saying is is going to be um, disproportionately impactful but I do believe mostly from watching my audiences, let's say, in my public tours, that the primary effect that I'm having is in helping individuals establish themselves more firmly in their personal and, and public lives, and that that's working very well. Jordan Peterson, we have to end there, but I thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation.